Hello, the objective today is to study what's known as the Lure problem, which corresponds to a very special class of nonlinear control problems. And these are the pro problems that can be put into that special feedback form that we saw um, in an earlier lecture. So the types of problem that we're going to study today, um, they involve a feedback interconnection where we have a linear component with a transfer function g of s, and this is in feedback with our nonlinearity. And this is a very common form for nonlinear analysis. What you do is you pull out your particular nonlinear effect of interest and just assume everything else is linear. You put it into this form and then you use all sorts of specialized analysis tools for the problems of this structure. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So when pulling out this nonlinearity, perhaps you could imagine that you have some motor in your process and this motor is linear unless it's trying to produce too much power. So as long as it stays within certain regions, everything behaves in a linear way. But then when it gets pushed too far, you hit some threshold or some saturation, and you then would capture that nonlinear effect by uh, using a single function h. You pull it out, you put it into this standard form, and then you can start to apply all of the tools that we're going to talk about um, over the next few lectures. So this is the setup, linear component, um, nonlinear term in feedback, and this corresponds to this class of state space model with the special structure that we saw in the earlier lecture. And from now on, the equilibrium point um, is going to assume, be assumed to be at the origin. And so a little bit more specifically, we're now going to develop special tools for analyzing this feedback interconnection. And the nonlinear function h lies within what are known as sector bounds. And to do that, we draw on some sector that looks like this. And it's characterized by two curves with two different slopes. And I'm going to call the slope. So I'm going to say that distance is 1, and this distance is k1. And similarly, we take a step of 1. So the slope of this line is k1, the slope of this line is k2, and we've got k1 is greater than or equal to k2. And we're just going to assume that our nonlinear function lies somewhere in this sector. So here we have h. And actually, the tools that we're driving today, um, this nonlinearity can be time varying. So when we saw this before, we just said h was h depended on what flows in here. That's still true, but we're also going to say h is allowed to vary over time as well. It's just it gives a little bit more generality to the results. And you don't you can ignore time and just assume that it's not time dependent if uh, if that makes it easier uh, to follow the steps. But know that it will apply even if it's time varying too. So we have some nonlinear function, and we're going to try and capture it with these within these two linear bounds. So what, what, what are some examples here? Well, suppose our nonlinearity in question was a saturation. So suppose we wanted to analyze that was supposed to go through the origin. So here we have a function that corresponds to being linear in some regime here. But then when you go too far, you reach a maximum output, and it just produces that output for every other input. So this, this type of nonlinearity is called the saturation, and it sort of corresponds to that motor analogy that we made earlier. Um, this could be captured within a sector with this for k1 and this for k2. So the idea is that we have these two general slopes, and they capture the basic property of the nonlinearity. And now we're just going to try and derive theoretical tools that will hold for all nonlinearities that are captured between a pair of slopes, k1 and k2. So let's start to try and imagine. Let's, uh, what do we think could be um, a reasonable stability criterion to have here? So if k1 was equal to k2, this would force our nonlinearity to be a straight line of a particular slope. Alternatively written, this would mean our nonlinearity would have to be u is equal to k. Um, okay, so we've, we've got a minus sign for our negative feedback here, but 
So let's say u would have to be equal to minus ky. So in the case that both of these slopes are equal to each other, our nonlinearity is forced to just be a constant, and this feedback loop just becomes a linear term in feedback with a constant. And we know how to analyze stability of a linear system in feedback with a constant. We use the Nyquist stability criterion. So maybe some kind of Nyquist type thinking is going to help get us somewhere. So let's just remind ourselves of what the Nyquist stability criterion is. So what we do is we have a picture of the complex plane here. And onto the complex plane, we draw the frequency response of our transfer function. So we plot a curve, and this curve has a direction, and each point on the curve corresponds to a value of g of j omega. And we just put in all of the different values of omega, we get different points on a Nyquist curve, and they together they sweep out a continuous curve, something like this. And then the Nyquist criterion says that as long as the minus 1 over k points, so the Nyquist criterion says that the feedback loop is stable if and only if the number of anti-clockwise encirclements um, encirclements of minus one over k is equal to the number of unstable um, open loop poles of G. So, so this is just a, this is the Nyquist criterion. And so the question is, does a Nyquist type theorem hold when analyzing uh, this special setup? And the answer is yes, but not quite. And this was actually the subject of a number of uh, famous conjectures um, from the 50s or 60s or something like that. And the first of these was the um, Eisenman conjecture. Um, so, and, and what he did was he conjectured that the equilibrium point was globally asymptotically stable if Nyquist holds for all, and then you have um, k1 greater than or equal to k greater than or equal to k2. So in the case that k1 is equal to k2, this collapses down to the linear case, um, and we can analyze things with the Nyquist criterion. What Eisenman was conjecturing was that, ah, okay, well let's put on the minus 1 over k1 and the minus 1 over k two point, and then let's just see if and make sure the Nyquist criterion holds for this range of 1 over k points, and if it does, then the equilibrium point will be globally asymptotically stable. And it turns out that this is false, um, so there are examples of non-linearities that obey these sector bounds, which will, and transfer functions g, for which you'll get something unstable. So this conjecture turned out to be false, and Kalman came up with a similar uh, one. Um, he said that he, well, he conjectured global asymptotic stability if Nyquist, uh, Nyquist holds, um, and he didn't use k1 and k2 corresponding to the slopes here. So let's, yeah, let's give them different names. So for um, k3 greater than k, greater than k4, where k3 is greater than d by dy of y, h of y. So this is something very similar. Um, so actually, Eisenman 
this is, this is an attempt to um, make things a little bit more stricter, consider a slightly different range of one of minus one over k points. Um, and maybe that would be enough to uh, prove uh, global asymptotic stability. And this is also false. And the version that is correct, and this is what we're going to be exploring today, is rather than checking the um, Nyquist criterion for a range of minus one over k points along this line segment, you actually have to check it for a circle instead. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to give some examples of what this means. And this condition is called the circle criterion. So we'll go into this in a little bit more detail and we'll use uh, the Apanov arguments from before to give a, a kind of informal, sketchy proof um, for why that's true. So today it will be the circle criterion. 